A very good morning and happy Sabbath to each one of you. We are so grateful that you can come again and be with us and celebrate Sabbath and listen to his word and grow in his grave. God is good. God is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to him, for he is good. You know, these are praises that we sing to God because we know that he is indeed good. Psalms chapter 28 verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I will praise him. You know, the Lord has provided so many scripture uh, verses for you and me today to help us struggle with our pains, our suffering, our health issues, our loss. And so may we turn to the Lord through his word and be encouraged. The devil's goal is to destroy us through depression, through loss, through pain, through suffering. But let us look beyond, for God is in control and he's coming back to see us soon. This afternoon, after our church service at 1 p.m., we have praise and prayer. We'd like to welcome you, as posted on our screen here. Number, phone number is 1-605-315-5889, followed by the passcode 546559-POUND. And that will bring you at 1 p.m., to our praise and prayer session where Patty um, Atkinson will be leading us. So you can join and call in when, if you are available. Um, just an update on church projects. As you know, we have many projects that, we, uh, that I related to you last week, you know, replacing some flooring in the church, the working on the front yard, the church lights, and also the sign in front of our church. So. Uh, we have started the painting of our rooms here in our church in preparation for the flooring. Uh, we were planning on doing four rooms, you know, at the cost of 4000 for replacement of the flooring. However, most of the church board members felt that we should consider doing a few other rooms, like um, the library, the children's room, and also the choir room where we have our praise and prayer every Sabbath after church. So uh, this will be brought to the church board for approval. Uh, we are looking at the cost of 8000 with special discount from the vendor. These other three rooms uh, are a little bit bigger. The two of the rooms are much bigger. And so the vendor is going to give us, has given us good discount, better than the first, to do these uh, seven rooms. So kindly... If you have some funds and you like to support God's work, please send them in. You can either drop it, drop it at my home or you could um, also um, mail or bring it to the church if the church is open and you can drop it off with the pastor or give it to Henry Chai. Um, or you can also do the online Adventist giving, okay, login, uh, create a login and send in your funds, and just note their church project. And so we will account and use that for uh, the uh, projects. Uh, today's offering is for our church budget, so kindly um, give so that we can support projects and also the ongoing expenses of our church. And without you, we will not be able to do it, and we want to thank you for, con for continuing to support the many projects in our church and our expenses. May God bless you as you do that. At this point of time, let us bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you have done for us. You are kind, you are good, you are gracious, you are loving, you are patient. May we learn from you. Forgive us where we have failed you. And help us, Father, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of troubles around us, that we will not be discouraged, but we will take this time to communicate and seek you so that we can be strong and that we can be witness for others around. 
our family, our friends, and our neighborhood. May you be with us as we continue our service. Bless our Pastor Chris as he breaks the bread of life and bless all the other participants, the ones who are giving special song. May they lift your name and may we be drawn closer through this music. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Job chapter 1, verse 20 to 22. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. He then fell to the ground in worship, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway. will overspread the sky but when traveling days are over not a shadow not a sigh when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory onward to the prize before us Tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll see. Shout the victory. We'll sing and shout the victory. Attitude of worship, even when times of unexpected change and challenges come. Its aim is to show how we can keep our strongest allegiance with God, even when faith is tested by tough moments. We are building up on our introductory theme, when God is our foundation. The last two Sabbaths, I spoke about the importance of leaning on the will of God, where it was pointed that the best way to approach fear and uncertainty is to follow Jesus' example in the spirit of submission, saying at all times, Thy will be done. Our natural emotional responses like fear, anxiety, worry, and anguish manifest the most in tough times. But the antidote of this is to lean on the will of God. Then the following week, I spoke about being sustained by the word of God, which emphasized that to overcome hopelessness, pain, sorrow, uncertainty, dark times, and temptations is to be sustained by the Word of God. If you notice, 
there are key phrases that I that are reiterated in this series, which is foundational in keeping our strong relationship with God. First is the will of God, and second is the word of God. Today, the message deals on worshiping God when tough moments in life come. How can we still worship God in times of tragedy? That's a question. You may say it is reasonably possible to worship God when life is smooth and calm. But on the other hand, it is more reasonably difficult to worship God when, lo when life gets rough, harsh, and stormy. However, worship is the breath of the soul. The soul cannot find rest and stability when the heart is not subdued by the greatness of God and an acceptance that He is the source of everything and He allows everything to happen. We know that in life, it is a constant battle. Life is constantly under threat of uncertainty and adversity, chains and challenges, crosses and crises, pettiness and futility. But with God, there is clarity in times of futility. There is clarity in times of uncertainty, rather. Victory in times of adversity. Stability in chains. Peace in challenges. Strength in crosses. And calmness in crisis. There is worth, there is worth in pettiness. And productivity in times of seeming futility. So if God supplies what life needs the most, He is therefore worthy of acknowledgement and reverence, or having the highest supremacy in life. In short, He is worthy of worship. People who see God as the center of their life grow stronger in their experience with Him when crisis comes in their life. God is whom they can find inner strength, and as an outflow, they tend to be more connected and abide with God in his spiritual matters and worship. Job is a prime example, prime example of a person whose relationship with God was unshakable. Job is a very popular book because we might not like his experience to be our experience, but how he responded to, to, to the greatest tragedy and difficulty in his life is overwhelmingly encouraging. Now, Job chapter 1 verse 3 says, there was a man in the land of Booz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and the one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. Now the passage shows that Job was a man of great power. He was a man of great prosperity. He was a man with a great family. But more importantly, he was a man who feared God and refused to do evil. He was a man who is blameless and upright in the eyes of the Lord and in the eyes of people. Job built his life around two important things good deeds to, to mankind, and loyalty and devotion to God. So Job was a man of great power. Being a man of great prosperity and with a great household, Job was considered the greatest of all the people in the East. Job was a worthy man, as we see it, a man of honor and in high authority. He was a man from the East, which suggests he was not a Hebrew to begin with which means he doesn't have an upbringing on the knowledge of God. On how did he find God, the Bible doesn't say. But he was not a Hebrew, as the scholars would say. His relationship with God, however, was personal rather than inherited. He might be an unbeliever by birth, and an unbeliever by descent. Yet here is the man that remained firm in God in time of his greatest tragedy. As an ancient tradition holds that the book of Job could be the earliest book in the Bible. Now if Job was not a Hebrew, but a believer of God, and if his book is the first book ever written, this would suggest that 
at the very opening of biblical inspiration when this Holy Spirit breathed into man the messages of God. It emphasizes the universality of God. That God is the God of all people. That God is the God of Hebrews and Gentiles alike. The name God and the Lord, and the name, the name God and Lord appeared 17 times in Job chapter 1 alone, which suggests the preeminence and supremacy of God in man's power, prosperity, and even in suffering. Job, a God, is in control. God is involved. Now, Job was a man of great prosperity. Job chapter 1 verse 3 says, His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very large household. If you compute that, the worth of all this are $40 million in today's value. But during Job's time when prosperity is measured not by money, but by amount of belongings, Job's prosperity is tremendously plenty. But his fortune turned to nothing in just one single day. You can see how much Job's worth was, but he turned from the most expensive man in the East to a man of nothing. But in the midst of the greatest crisis in his life, he stood firm in his relationship with God. Job was a man with a great household. The Bible says that Job had a, had a great household. He had seven sons and three daughters and a large number of servants. Now, back in the day when people's influence was measured by the amount of property and the, the, and the size of household, Job sees his life flows in abundance and security, nothing that he can ask for more. Now, he, we know in empirical knowledge that parents care for their children. The Bible says that Job would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Job's first job each day and very early in the morning is to make sure that his children have the right standing with God. Job was so concerned about his children's faith. It is highly important to not neglect and to put the highest priority of attention to our children. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring are, are, they are the offspring and a reward from God. Now, when it seems that the tragedy of losing his livestock and material possessions was so great for a man to carry, that a news came that all his children died together in one place and in one day. At once, in one single day, Job lost everything. He lost his possession, he lost his power, and worst of all, he lost all his ten children. Now you remember King David after he lost his son Absalom. In 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 33, it says, And the king was much moved, and went up to the chamber over the gate, and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, David was decomposed upon the death of one of his children. Rebellion he was. David was succumbed by sorrow. Now Job lost all his children in one single day. In the morning he had ten children, but in the afternoon he was childless. Yes, a bright sunny morning could turn into a day where a dark cloud gathers and a violent storm comes. That violent storm came to Job. They all died together, and that one of them was left alive. His children, which were the heritage and reward from the Lord, were all gone. A person not like Job will ask God so many questions, or blame God, or rebel against God, or forsake Him all at once. But how did Job respond to such overwhelming tragedy? Job chapter 1 verse 20 says, Then Job arose, tore his clothes, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. How did he find a reason to worship God in times of greatest tragedy? Job chapter 1 verse 21 tells us why Job's response was to worship God. He said, Naked I came from a mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job responded in, re in reverence to God and adoration to the Lord. And highlighting his sovereignty in saying, God gave and God takes away. Job understands God's sovereignty in everything related to him. Job understood that nothing in his life, his power, his prosperity, and even his family was outside the influence and the authority of God. The word sovereignty is a big word here. I want to quote several verses in the Bible to show God's sovereignty. Revelation chapter 21 verse 6 says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 says, For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 says, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and an outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God's sovereignty means that everything is under God's influence and authority. Nothing passes without His knowledge and consent. In the words of Job, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. When a person comes to this point of understanding in life, trouble may come, suffering may rise, fear may grow, but the only response was to worship God, being the God who is in control of everything. Such acknowledgement produces inner strength in times of difficulty. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes in the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields grow, produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in, joyful in my God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread to the heights. You see, Job understood well God's sovereignty. At the very opening of the book of Job, it says further that he was a man who feared God and refused to do evil. He was blameless and upright. Accepting God's sovereignty produces fear of the Lord. Refusing to do evil and walking blameless and upright in the eyes of the Lord. Notice that God knew Job's faithfulness and he was highly approved by God. It is in this setting that Satan came to the action, to the scenario. Job chapter 1 verse 8 says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Now Job's life was that even in prosperity and power, his devotion to God is stood firm. He stays the same. Thus, when a very tough, tough, uh, tough time in his life came, he withstood the trials and overcame the test. God knew how firm Job's loyalty to him was. Job didn't put his prosperity before God, but he put God as the source of his prosperity. God is the source of that prosperity. And that God has a say over what he but over what his life holds. His prosperity does not define his loyalty to God. Job holds that God has supreme control over his prosperity. It is in this that Satan attacked the character of Job. Job chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 say, Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, Have you not put a hedge around him? and his household, and everything he has. You have blessed the work of his hands, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand, and strike him, and everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Now Satan connects Job's fear of God with the blessings that he received. Contrary to the accusation against Job's character, however, when all things are taken from him, he stood firm with God and he responded in worship. Job's tone of faithfulness didn't change in times of crisis and affliction. It is an example for every believer of Christ that whatever circumstances we may face in life, even to the point that things that are important to us are taken away, 
God forbid. But our loyalty and allegiance to God should not waver, would not change. This comes when our allegiance to God is not based on earthly and material things. On the one hand, it is good when God answers our prayers for having a good career, a good house, good cars, a good material possessions, a good family. But they should not define our love and loyalty to God. Our loyalty to God is not based on our worth or how much we have become worthy as a person. On the other hand, our loyalty and firm connection with God should be based on our, under, on our understanding of His nature, who He is as God, His love, His grace, His mercy, His faithfulness and everything. If we know about that and we have a firm understanding of that, our faith will never change and waver even though we experience trials and difficulties in life. Satan said that Job will surely curse God, but in response to his tragedy, Job worshiped God. Instead of cursing God, Job worshiped God. Worship is a big word. He worshiped God and he blessed God. I want to say amen to that. Now why? Because Job understood who God is. He knew what kind of God he served. John Piper, a well-known theologian and preacher says, True worship is based on a right understanding of God's nature. And it is a right valuing of God's worth. When we have the right understanding of God's nature, His love, His power, His grace, His mercy, His unchanging nature, and the fact that He is God, and outside of Him, there is no other God. And upon reflecting how worthy God is, rather than reflecting how worthy we are, we will respond in all our circumstances in life in worship, to worship God. Affirming that God is the source of all things and everything in life would lead to worship. That God is the source and the cause of all things that we possess. And it would lead to our duty to worship God in everything and all, in all things. Ellen G. White says, The duty to worship God is based upon the fact that He is the Creator and that to Him all other beings owe their existence. Everything owes their existence from God. In our Christian walk, it is important to increase our knowledge of God daily. John chapter 17 verse 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The word know means intimate knowledge rather than cognitive knowledge in knowledge of the mind. It is not a knowledge based on information alone. It is a knowledge that, that is based on experience. When we come to the full knowledge of God through our intimacy with Him, we can only respond in uncertainty and adversity, chains and challenges, crosses and crises, pettiness and futility, with the work with, and futility with the worship of God. Job's secret of success what not, was not just blessing and worshiping God based on what was on the outside, meaning material possession, but on the inner work within him. Job feared God, and the basis of that fear is his constant dependence on God. Our success in faith journey would be the same. I like this illustration. It says, the secret, success, the secret of success is to be like a duck, smooth and unruffled on top, but paddling furiously under it. With all Job's possession and power and success, we might be seeing him living a smooth and unruffled on the outside, but inside of him was a constant dependence on God. It is how we would need to live our Christian life as well. Though the world around us might only see a good thing that we have in life, and with all the success that we achieve, it is, however important, that inside us is a constant work of furious puddling of dependence on God, on God, everything we do and everything we have. Moreover, I want to use the analogy of Christian life to that of flying. Our life is a constant flying towards our desired destination, which is ultimately, as Paul says, finish your race, finish our race, and we are to remain faithful to the end. 
But sometimes we feel weak and beaten, defeated and abandoned. Church, if we have this closest encounter with God, He is always on our side. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 27 says, The eternal God is the refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and He shall drive out the enemy from before them. Psalm chapter 63 verse 8 says, I cling to you, your right hand upholds me. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Now there are things that I want you to bring home today and take in your life. We don't own anything. Because if we do, it wouldn't be taken away from us. However, we might not be owning anything, but we can own God's providence. Things that we have now could be taken away from us, but nothing can take us away if we are faithful and devoted to God. The Lord came and the Lord has taken away. Job was steadfast in his relationship with God, thus passing the trials with applause. God will do what is right. We may encounter terrible experience in life, but trust in Him. God will do what is right for us. This is a hard concept to understand. That is why we need to know God more and more. We need to learn more of Him daily and constantly. Because with it, we can find the reason to worship Him in whatever circumstances. Keep that sweet communion with Him. Always and be constant in praise. And worship God daily. Practice to worship God in whatever circumstances. So when the greatest strategy of life comes, that worshiping attitude will not leave our hearts. Job, who was not a Hebrew, but showed his unwavering faith in God in difficult circumstances. And it would mean that anybody can find their comfort and strength in God. And that in times of suffering and pain in life, there is no other course of strength but to walk in the path of God. We know the fact that suffering respects no race or culture. Either a person is a believer or unbeliever. No one is immune to suffering. Humanity is engulfed with suffering. Life is intertwined with pain. Thus, there is no surprise that when a baby is born, the very first sign of life is the sound of crying. No one is excused to suffering, and no one can inhibit himself from pain. Job tells us that whatever your upbringing is, whether you are born as an atheist, as a Christian, an agnostic, a communist, an esoterist, an evolutionist, or whatever your upbringing is, a believer or unbeliever, whatever ideology one might hold, when confronted by the greatest tragedy and crisis in life, there is no other source of strength but the Lord God in heaven. It is the ongoing emphasis of this series to have God as our foundation because He is the source of ultimate strength for everybody. God cares for all people and that people can all count on God. God gives blessing and His blessing is not bound within the corners and ages of race, culture, and religious belief or non-belief. God cares for everyone and that He is waiting for everyone to call on Him. Farther, since worship in times of tragedy is emphasized by Job, who was not a believer of God in cultural setting, anybody regardless of culture or religious upbringing can look up to God when they face trials and challenges in life. God will never forsake them. He is waiting for them to come to Him. When difficulty comes, it is because God is bringing out in us our higher value. I like this illustration. It says, a bar of steel is worth $5. When it is wrought on a horseshoe, it is worth $10. If made into needles, it is worth $350. If wrought into penknife blades, it is worth $32,000. And if it is wrought into springs of watches, it is worth $250,000. You can see that when that bar of steel 
when that bar of steel is drilled and will undergo to suffering and pain and the process of pain, its worth will become higher. But the more it is manipulated and the more it is hammered and passed through the fire and beaten and pounded and polished and greater the value it would be. So the same, those who suffer most are capable of yielding the most. As it is through pain that God can get the most out of us. That is coded in the streams of the desert, by the way. Christians like tea, their real strength is not drawn out until they get into hot water. Knowing that we are all heaven bound, everyone that gets on the throne must put their foot on the thorn. The way to the crown is the cross. We must taste the fall before we are to taste the glory. God brought Israel through the Red Sea. He led them into the wilderness, then to the promised land. Finally, Job's poverty and prosperity and his family were all ruined, but his patience remained. In life, nothing is permanent, and no amount of prosperity can secure us, but only uprightness in the eyes of God can preserve us. Temporal comforts could vanish in a day, but the satisfaction with the Lord, in all circumstances, it stays the same. If he had based the principle of his relationship with God upon his riches, he would have lost his relationship with God when he lost everything he had. But Job was patient in everything. Someone said patience is virtue. That's right. He was prosperous in life, but devoted to God in faith. He was patient in life, as his faith has informed him. He sets an example for us to look upon, that even when we suffer in affliction, we can still see God in those trials. We might have dirt in forms of trials and tragedy in our life, but those are necessary for us to grow. Job was, was in a bad spot of life, the day that he wished wouldn't come, but he, he came out good by keeping the attitude of praising and worshiping God. In the midst of difficulty, Job's character is still remained. We can see how sincere he was in his relationship with God. We may find trouble on the way to our duty with God and with other people, but God may use those troubles to grow us and make us useful for him. At the end of Job chapter 1, the verse says, In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Yes. What a beautiful expression in life. Imagine you are watching a movie and you're watching the life of Job. When Job heard that he lost everything that he had worked, that he had worked for, and all things are gone. Much worse, his children are gone. You might say that Job would respond in revenge, in rebellion, remorse, or defiance in the face of tragedy. And these are typical human responses. But Job responded with one big word. He worshiped God in an act of reverence, praise, and he blessed the name of the Lord. Yes, church, this is who we are. There are many trials and challenges in life. But when we are constant in our dependence of God, and if we have the right concept of God, of who he is, we might come through suffering. We might come through pain. We might lost everything precious to us. But we will only respond in worship and reverence in God. May God bless you all with this message.